some of you will uh, recognize the lack of originality in the title. Uh, Riding the Tiger is a fairly hackneyed expression used quite often by those whose uh, policy of responding to the perhaps unheralded challenges of the modern world consists not in the perhaps uh, requisite uh, eschatological sharia expectation or directive to head for the hills uh, with the, the proverbial flock of sheep, but to jump on the back of this threatening tiger and to see if one can attempt to tame it. One might say that much of the quote-unquote Islamist agenda of the past 50 years, perhaps more, has been based on the idea that one can, for instance, rather than retreat from the banking system, attempt to carve out a niche within it, or even to tame it in some sense, so that it can once again be directed towards uh, a just and legitimate Sharia end. The idea of the nation state, another bugbear of many of our brethren, is, in the eyes of many, something that can be appropriated and turned into something called an Islamic state. We can even have an Islamic republic. Interesting irony when you consider that republicanism, particularly in its enlightenment guise, emerged specifically as an antidote to a perceived clerisy or uh, theocracy. Republicanism was the child of Carbonari, uh, Freemasons of various kinds, French revolutionaries, uh, people whose uh, principal aim in life was to push religion back where they thought it belonged uh, into a box, leaving the public square to the republican and essentially laic mentality. But we have, following the Khomeinist revolution, the idea of an Islamic republic, a very strange uh, pair of bedfellows. But this is the discourse that some of our brethren, perhaps with commendable courage, have sought that instead of the traditional modality of taking a step back in times of turbulence, one takes a step forward, the presumption that Islam is a proactive rather than reactive religion, and one should seek to appropriate the technologies, the modalities, the structures, the infrastructures of modernity in order to turn them to benign and humanitarian ends. So riding the tiger is a fairly hackneyed expression. Some of you may recall that it goes back in certain circles to the uh, by now classic work of Julius Evola, Chevaucher le Tigre, Ride the Tiger. He generally implied it in the sense of, a, uh, of an imperative. Full title is a survival manual for the aristocrats of the soul. This emerges from an intellectual world generally unfamiliar to most Muslims who have difficulties strolling into a bookshop and even picking up books to enable them to understand the mainstream principles of modernity, let alone dissident voices within it. But some will be aware that within the story of Western modernity and the agonistic progress towards a still undefined, unimaginable utopian endgame, there have been many dissidents of sometimes a Christian disposition, sometimes of a, a class war disposition, sometimes of a racist disposition, who have sought to jump ship uh, because of their radical interrogation of the value of the modern project whose process of acceleration seems to them more likely to be a presage of downward than of upward movement. Modernity as in the grip of the law of gravity. Its acceleration itself grounds for suspiciousness and uh, dissent. Julius Ebola himself, a tragic figure, uh, a prophetic figure, but one whose vocabulary did not extend to an embracing of the second Semitism of Islam. Others of his generation, such as the fabled René Guénon, Abdul Wahid Yahya, did, in their very uh, selective and possibly idiosyncratic sense, move in the direction of Islam, which they took to be Europe's third neglected heritage, a last repository of tradition, with a capital T, uh, thereby excusing one the duty of moving further east, as many of the German romantics had done, to seek a ressourcement of spiritual values in the heritage of the putatively Aryan subcontinent. But this second Semitism has been a, a minoritarian option for most Europeans who have not bought the ideology of progress and are concerned with the atomism of the, on the human soul, the human subject, human society, which they take the Enlightenment uh, inescapably to produce. So Ebola, a very strange person, 
somebody who is in many ways inimical to an Islamic perspective, someone who bought in to certain aspects of the race theory of his day and indeed spent some time during the war lecturing at an SS college, not a natural bedfellow for Muslim thinkers, one might think. But nonetheless, somebody who has had a very significant role in triggering the counterculture. It's not a left-wing counterculture, it's not a right-wing counterculture, but it is a counterculture which has uh, continued to this day and which unfortunately is moving in the direction following the decline of the old Marxian alternative, the significant alternative to the progressist utopian discourse of liberal capitalism, has moved in the direction of forms of xenophobia. So if you Google Julius Ebelard now, you'll within a couple of clips find yourself in very clicks, find yourself in very unfamiliar territory in various anti-immigrant websites, Ukrainian supremacist movements and the like, places where normally we don't, uh, we don't populate. But nonetheless, uh, his discourse and the discourse of that cloud of thinkers around him who are not really content with the uh, pseudoscience of the uh, racial alternatives to the modernistic secularizing process of the mid 20th century um, represents uh, a vision that can offer Muslims at least pause for thought when we consider what our due response to modernity should be. Should it be just ad hoc, we like certain things and we don't like others, as if the modern world is a kind of buffet from which we might safely graze while avoiding the, 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 the alcohol dishes and the pork dishes, but everything else we can consume. Is that really our big philosophy when we confront the menu of modernity? Or is there a deeper uh, reservation of heart? Are we, as uh, Evola's subtitle suggests, aristocrats of the soul? Now here you have some kind of egotistic claim that there is a vanguard, an elite, uh, a small number of human beings who have not been subject to the conditioning of the mass media and state-directed educational processes, who have not been brainwashed, but retained the right to a deep sense of dissent and lack of assent to the premises of modernity, which raises what is perhaps one of the largest questions confronting modern Europe in particular, which is to say, if the dominant ideology is to be liberalism, to what extent can liberalism, ostensibly a doctrine of tolerance, actually tolerate anything other than itself? Liberalism, in some ways, seems to be becoming increasingly coercive. You must have such and such a curriculum. You must have certain views about alternative sexualities. You must have certain views about gender. You must have certain views, etc., etc. An increasingly proliferating list of boxes which one is expected to tick which seems to sit ill with the basic premise of liberalism, which is to open the horizons to pe for people to think and behave as they will, as long as they don't uh, constitute a threat to public order. And the current strange liberal inquisition in the schools, thou shalt be a liberal, uh, instituted by Ofsted and other quasi-state uh, institutions. It's just an example of the inherent paradox of this late liberal, or we might say coercive liberal project. Europe's xenophobia, in a rather curious way, is being triggered by that liberalism whose roots lie in uh, a campaign to open the horizons for human plurality and difference, a process stretching back at least as far as the 18th century, now being used as an implicitly persecutory discourse. And Slavoj Žižek and others have remarked on the inherent violence of a certain type of liberal capitalistic uh, discourse, particularly in the way in which it marginalizes those whose dissent is outside uh, the canon of forms of life which are officially approved by the dominant culture and the increasing strictures of the, the mass media. So Evola is a point of reference for people who uh, are seeking an alternative, but unfortunately because of his possibly xenophobic uh, blind spot when it came to Europe's third heritage, as Roger Garodi called it, um, the heritage of Islam. Garodi's move was definitely in the direction of the underestimated Ishmaelite uh, Semitism. Uh, much of his analysis is alien and difficult. But still, there is much that we can find to be of value, not least because he did find an almost cosmological uh, environment for his discourse. 
He believed, drawing on what he called, along with the Genonians, tradition, with a capital T, that we inhabit some sort of cosmic endgame, that the signs of the hour are upon us, that the current breakdown of tradition, of monarchy, of order, of natural hierarchy, of a sense of the sacred, is an inevitable and indeed predicted presaging of the last days, the Torba Magna. He certainly saw himself as being an aristocratic hero crying in the wilderness of modern consumer blandness. So he ha has another book, Revolt Against the Modern World, Politics, Religion, and the Social Order in the Kali Yuga. Here, like a lot of thinkers who thought that Europe's spiritual ressourcement had to be in some putative Aryan substrate, he's happy to mine the Brahmanical concept of the four ages, the Kali Yuga, the age of iron, the dark age being the end of the great circle of samsara, when things really start to break up, when human beings are so dark in their perception of the inherent radiance of matter and nature that all they see is matter and nature, and they lack the ability to see its inherent translucence, the loss of the most fundamental defining human attribute, which is the capacity to perceive the sacred. So dull have we become that we take matter at face value and are no longer able to see beyond its surface. So this is the dark age, the age of iron, the age of dissolution, of hierarchy, of family, of priesthood, of the sacred, of pilgrimage, of all of the things that historically shaped uh, and defined the, the, the guiding priorities of normative humanity. We are, for Ebola, now inhabiting that age of darkness. So this is part of his vocabulary, and Guénon and those of his persuasion followed him. Uh, Ahmed Herlihi is another um, American writer who has written specifically for Muslims on this idea of, of, of the, the, the age of darkness. And Ebola's idea being that we can somehow ride the tiger. That is to say, we can master it within limits. We can inhabit it uh, not as passive subjects and victims, but in some sense as active agents of change. And here he adverts to what he takes to be one of the neglected aspects of tradition, which is unique, its unique capacity to tap forms of human energy. Access to the sacred gives human beings access to a form of nuclear energy that has no half-life, that continues indefinitely. The great driving force of humanity is either an authentic or a spurious simulacrum form of the religious energy. Everything else dissipates in pleasures, self-serving uh, pursuits of the seven deadly sins, and ultimately is inebriated and inert. The energies of the sacred, however, the unique human capacity to strive, to sacrifice, to reach beyond the demands of the senses, which is the gift of a belief in eternal life, and the gift of a belief that beyond the dull, black, material carapace of things, there lies a world of glowing beauty, that energy, he believes, is sufficient to enable us to ride the tiger, even amidst the dark shadows of an ignorant uh, modern world. So we have Evola's uh, legacy. As usual, we Muslims rarely stray into uh, the bookshops, and we don't really know what this critique of modernity might signify. But it's picked up uh, in the European far right, which represents yet another missed opportunity, one would say. The European far right is partly xenophobic, anti-immigrant, quite often uh, explicitly or implicitly racist. But it is also often based on a certain anxiety about the loss of meaning, the confiscation of identity by modernity, for which it uses often the immigrant, the strange-looking guy with the corner shop, as the scapegoat. But it also represents a form of dissidence uh, that has as its root a genuine unease about what and who we become when all of the traditional constituents of our identity, monarchy, district, pilgrimage, the sacred, priesthood, going to church, everything has been taken away. Even the significance of the flag and the old regiments and all of those old sort of biscuit tin Victorian illuminations that sort of constituted the corny definition of what it meant to be Victorian or Edwardian, all of those things have been taken away uh, to be replaced by this bland consumer okay. void with its endless capacity uh, and its, its, its two-dimensional brilliance to appeal to everything that is lazy and low and lustful about our lower selves. Recently, just I think it was last week, I happened to be going to an interfaith meeting at Windsor Castle, a rather awkward place to get into, actually, when the Queen is in residence. You have to pass through various 
uh, levels of people in different sorts of uniforms carrying different forms of, of weaponry. Um, uh, but uh, I was actually prevented, not by uh, the boys in blue, but by the fact that my talk had coincided with the weekly changing of the guards. And so between me and the point where I had to go in order to give my lecture, there was sort of the, the band of the Coldstream Guards and a lot of guardsmen marching up and down with bayonets drawn. And of course, there was no way in which I could sort of uh, slip across the courtyard while that was in progress. I would have been trampled underfoot. Uh, so I just waited there, fiddling with my phone, hoping that this would be an adequate excuse for giving my lecture late. But actually, it turned out to be an interesting experience. Normally, that is not my natural habitat at all. But observing the guards and then observing the spectators, almost all teenagers, school children, visitors from various places, but essentially young England, really was an interesting lesson. Here you have, in Windsor Castle, the epitome of a traditional dusty, patriotic, English faded identity. The changing of the guard, there are the cold streams with their battle honours, nobody knows what they're looking at any longer, but the last charge at Waterloo and Salamanca and Ciudad Real and Monte Cassino, battle honours as long as your arm, marching up and down. But they are so aware that this is no longer understood that when the band struck up and the teenagers looked cynical, the first tune that they played was the theme tune from the new Star Wars movie. <laughs> I was expecting the British Grenadiers or some Sousa classics from the early 20th century, something retro, but no, it was selected highlights from Hollywood blockbusters. And of course, the assembled teenagers, when they looked up from fiddling with their phones and pinching each other and giggling, they just started to dance. <laughs> that is how British identity has now, has now become. And that is where we now stand. And that is a strange ending for the national alternative to the former religious narrative, which used to define what we were about. It was St. George's Chapel, which was the heart of, of Windsor Castle. And then it became the, the Queen's private uh, apartments. And now, what is it? Even the national secular narratives completely uh, voided so that you just have the teenagers kind of rocking and rolling and fighting and laughing and applauding at the end because they've got no idea what else to do. Uh, and that's the end even of that alternative narrative to the old Christian narrative. And this is precisely why a lot of people in Europe are deeply uneasy because they don't necessarily want to have only that. This is what Charles Taylor, in his brilliant recent book, A Secular Age, calls the felt flatness of modernity. Mm -hmm. Not only is it flat compared to the, the depths and the vertiginous sense of the sacred and the overwhelming and eternity and beauty and grace and heaven and hell and God and the magnificence of the traditional view that human beings were surrounded by, but the flatness. But we also feel it. There's a certain sense of loss. We know that we've lost something, and we have this awkward, anxious sense that perhaps what we've lost is what actually is the most important thing, and that everything else is just a papering over of that increasingly vast crack. So uh, the question that is being asked by present-day advocates of the Evola attempt to ride the tiger, to try and for find forms whereby the world can be resacralized re re uh, is something that underpins this new unease, this growing earthquake that was recently represented, for instance, in the, the German uh, provincial elections <coughs> with the frightening return of the far right in very many, even West German lender. Uh, it is there and it is on the march, but it is only in part because they don't want to have more Syrians in the country. It is because they are deeply unease, uh, uneasy about what they are, where they're going, the political elite that's leading them to more and more blandness uh, away from tradition. So the blurb of a recent book in this, uh, in this uh, world, Marcus Villinger's book, Generation Identity, which is about our current attempt to live rich and pleasurable and prosperous lives in the absence of meaning and identity, just looking at the blurb, talking about Europe, her native population consists mostly of atomistic individuals lacking any semblance of purpose or direction, increasingly victimised by a political system with no interest in the people it governs. The, the oft-lamented 
growth in the, uh, the gulf between rich and poor is just one sign of that. But the fact that the politicians are not trusted, that their discourse seems to be increasingly platitudinous, that they know that um, nobody really believes they'll deliver on their electoral promises, a certain sundering, an absence of trust between governed and governors is uh, one of the increasing sources of unease. But what we have, therefore, is the apotheosis, albeit unlooked for, of the original hope of the Enlightenment, which is that in the absence of the sacred, which for them represented the kind of dark shadows of the church and its strictures, which had to be pushed away as much as possible, in favor of the lumière, the Enlightenment, <coughs> where the human subject is the measure of all things, so we have Rousseau and Voltaire and Kant, the kind of holy trinity of, of the thinkers of the modern world, the individual, the miracle of the human conscience as that which can determine what is right without reference to holy books or to a putative natural theology, but just man, the measure of all things, has been increasingly decomposing as a result of scientific, neurological, philosophical, psychological historic interrogations of the idea of the coherence of the human subject itself. So modernity lapses and uh, uh, limps into post-modernity so that the very sovereign human subject, which the Enlightenment thought that it could put in the space vacated by the Christian God, is itself in a state of increasing crisis and anxiety, thereby producing these relatively minor epiphenomena, whether it be Pegida, in Germany, or Donald Trump in America, or some of Putin's supporters, etc. And there are, of course, clones and replicas, simulacra of this phenomena in India, in China, in the Muslim world, everywhere. That this is something that uh, represents a sense of crisis, that modernity has come to an end. Post-modernity is precisely constituted in the deconstruction of that human subject, which was supposed to be the fountainhead of meaning and beauty and philosophy and values that the Enlightenment was heralding. So what we find now as Muslims emerging into this rather broken and damaged landscape is a conversation radically unlike any that we have had with another civilization at any time in our history. And uh, our own ways of responding Islamically to this smuggle in, albeit uh, amidst furious denials, much of this same crisis. So much Muslim talk is about boundary issues, is about identity, is about being something, more than it is about believing something. Ethics tends to be subsumed under a kind of furious legalism that is largely a matter of defending one's threatened sense of self at all costs, rather than being connected to a genuine sense of what is right and what is wrong. Recently, uh, one of my students carried out a set of experiments, he's got a PhD in uh, neurology, in which he wired up various religious young British Muslims, and uh, it's interesting to see them removing their headgear and see if they've got any hair or not, and uh, some of them were quite easy to attach the probes to their heads, and just measuring them as their brains responded to certain propositions. And very often he found, to his embarrassment, he's a Muslim himself, that what the Muslim brains were actually doing was very different to what the Muslim mouths were actually saying. Yes, we believe in this about the family and gender, and the hudud punishment. But actually, the brain is doing something else. And this cognitive dissonance is something that is very painful for a lot of people and generates forms of, as it were, fundamentalism that seek to inhabit that, that critical space, that dissonance, and to try and close that gap. In other words, the denial of reality in favor of a furious defense of increasingly extreme and often ahistorical readings of the sharia. These uh, tendencies are a psychological reflex. They are not based in any way on an objective or responsible or authentic reading of the usul of Islamic uh, jurisprudence, but nonetheless uh, powerful and destructive for all of that. <coughs> so it is about the self, the crisis of the self, not just on the streets of Dresden, but also uh, in the Muslim self, a sense of anxiety, the confiscation of identity, fact that the old signposts are being worn away by these uh, winds of consumerism and Hollywood and an anxiety to replace them with ultra-sharp 
repristinated versions of their original self. And hence the strange reactiveness of so much of the Muslim community in Europe. To see uh, German converts in Berlin wearing what the Germans call desert clothes, cotton, Arabian stuff. Very strange, particularly since I was there in February. And it's pretty obvious that if you're saying, I'm going to wear desert clothes in Brandenburg in February, that you've got some kind of dissonance going on because your interpretation of religion really doesn't fit the fact that it's really cold and wet. But that's just a sign, an outward sign, of the incapacity of the Muslim genuinely and in a responsible and authentic way to look at the usul, to see what is authentic here, rather than just panicking about making concessions to the kuffar. So we have this, the anxiety of the self, but also at the same time, the idea of the sovereignty of the self. One of the things that the nafs does when it feels anxious and threatened, when its old landmarks are being confiscated, is to retreat into a sense of its own power and sovereignty. And this is the, the self that, that is commanding, that wants to be in authority. And this is one of the things that Europe has discovered. The self becomes not just the measure of all things, but the instructor and the determiner of values. And this is one of the paradoxes of Western modernity. A hundred years ago, it was assumed women, of course, couldn't vote. Now, if anybody says that they shouldn't be voting, uh, you certainly don't get a job with the BBC, and it's, you're kind of really strange. It's a constant process of adaptation and change, because not only is the self detecting value in the world, as Kant thought it could do, but it is actually making values, and it is doing through, so through various forms of, of consensual movement, whose ultimate shape and shapers may not be discernible to anybody. So if anything is certain about the current value set of the global elite, it is that in 50 years' time, it'll be something very different. And this is, again, something that makes it difficult for us to ride that tiger, because the tiger itself doesn't really have a destination, but it's constantly experiencing new inner states that push it in a different direction. Remember when the Fouad, the first university, was created in Egypt, first secular Western-style university in the Arab world, didn't have female students. Why? Because it wanted to be modern. Traditional madrasas could often, especially in the Mamluk period, have women, and there were madrasas for women in Cairo and Damascus. If you want to be modern, before the First World War, no, it has to be for men, of course, and in Cambridge, maybe they could attend lectures, but they would be then parked in, in Girton and... Uh, Newnham, and certainly not allowed to take, uh, take degrees. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. That's a mindset, a cognitive frame that is now very hard for people to imagine. But back then, our reality would have been unimaginable. Therefore, the only thing that's certain about the current boxes that we're required to tick is that 50 years down the line, certainly 100 years down the line, the current social orthodoxies will be outrageous and unthinkable heresies, and the West will be doing something new. This, again, makes it difficult for us to engage in the conversation on a deep level rather than a kind of firefighting and, and immediate utilitarian level because there don't seem to be any usul, and instead things are just endlessly mobile. The extraordinary mobility of modernity, which generates such incredible power, artistic power, and the Hollywood and the economic thing and the stock exchange is a good example of the kind of brilliant randomness of, of, of the culture that because of this, everything is in flux. And Slavoj Žižek also has an interesting lecture, you can see it <coughs> on YouTube, I think, where he says that the majority <coughs> of people who work in the investment banking system, apologies to one or two friends present, but the majority of them, he said, they don't go to church, they're doing some form of spirituality that relates to Buddhism, mm -hmm. whether it be mindfulness or meditation or some other thing. Why is that? He says, because Buddhism also believes that the ultimate cannot be grasped and that the world is constantly in a state of flux and the self is not actually there. The self is not real. This is the doctrine of anatta, no self. You begin with a kind of useful fiction that you do have a self, but you end up realizing that it's not there. And he says, that's exactly what the stock, stock market is. All of these numbers flitting around and people inventing money and creating money on the basis of money that they say somebody else is going to create and this enormous, extraordinary, randomized world this is the perfect image for our modernity and the modern soul. And that's why Buddhism kind of fits into that world, even though what Gautama Buddha himself would have thought of 
Riggs Bank or JP Morgan is another question, but that, that seems to be where they are spiritually at home. So flux and the void, endless motion, a kind of celebration of randomness uh, is something that is the nature of the modern process, which again makes it difficult for us to have a conversation with it because they're not Ahlul Kitab any longer. They're something very strange, something without precedent. Uh, and I think that we have been wrong-footed here. And often our response is, just as they, on their fringes, are looking for some kind of residual token of selfhood, so usually, unfortunately, they don't go to Evensong any longer. They go on some kind of anti-immigrant BNP march. Uh, that is the kind of degraded way in which they reconnect with, with the indigenous, and the sense of Britishness or Europeanness or Americanness. It's a kind of... David Duke, uh, ridiculous, um, crude reification of the worst aspects of, of the culture. That tends to be where that fringe moves to. But in the Islamic context, the similar uh, ambience, the atmosphere which we breathe, which uh, flatters us by saying that the self is sovereign and that says we need to be skeptical if the self is to defend itself as sovereign, of inherited hierarchy and authority and institutions is producing analogous movements in the Ummah of Islam. Why is it that so many people find their spiritual home, say, with the works of Ibn Taymiyyah rather than Al-Ghazali? Ibn Taymiyyah, really an outlier in Islamic history. Not re even his, his famous followers didn't really follow him in a lot of things. And the Ummah generally passed by his, his thought in silence. He believed that beyond the claimed contemporary consensus of the ulama and the established wisdom of the four madhabs and the ashaira and the established Sufi tariqas, there could be some sovereign principle within the soul of the believer himself, namely the fitra, which could enable one ultimately to have a good intuitive believer sense of what actually is right or wrong. So if Ibn Taymiyyah, there is the sunnah, as intuited correctly by the sound fitra of the human being. And there's something very humanistic about this. Some people like Laos, some of the Orientalists quite like Ibn Taymiyyah because of his high opinion of the human capacity to know what's right. But of course, from the point of view of the stability of the tradition, it's a subversive message. If you're saying, the four madhabs require me to pray like this, but my fitra, reading the Qur'an and the Sunnah, say that actually I should pray like that. You have something that might claim to be a unifying principle, but which in practice tends to shatter the madhahib of Islam into as many madhahib as there are human beings who think they're in touch with their fitra. <coughs> it's impossible to advert to the fitra without also opening the door to human subjectivity and to a raft of anxieties about what people actually want to do. So you have people looking into the usul and saying that they can find things like targeting civilians in Belgium um, whereas, in fact, something like that is clearly ruled out by the four madhabs. And this is the, the risk. This is the danger. And anybody who reads the seerah can see how far this is. And this is a kind of parenthesis, but it is important. What would be the seerah equivalent of what happened in Paris and Belgium? Well, the equivalent, I guess, would be for somebody from Medina to go to Mecca <coughs> and to go to the marketplace, pull out a knife and start stabbing people at random. That's the equivalent thing. That's essentially what they did in Belgium and in Paris and in an increasing number of other places, just to evince one's anger and one's rejection just by killing people from the other side at random, irrespective of how they voted or what their view is on foreign policy, just, just to kill them. And this is the way of the jahiliya. The jahiliya is precisely predicated on the sovereign human self. The hamiya til jahiliya, the feverishness of the jahiliya, is about us versus them, my tribe, right or wrong, with no real aversion to higher ethics or a sense that kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahina. Every soul is a hostage for what it has, has acquired. No, nope. it's back to the tribal age of us versus them. And this aversion is precisely what happens when the nafs becomes sovereign and is so pleased with itself that it thinks that it can sit on some high throne and look down on the ulama of the madahib and all of the ulama of tasawwuf and all of the ulama of kalam and say, nope, I may just be a dentistry student 
in Antwerp, but I know better than Al-Ghazali and Juwaini and Ibn Hanbal and all of those. That's very gratifying for the self. And there is something in that fundamentalist impulse, the trusting of the fitra, which really is a euphemism for doing your own thing. There is a certain convergence between that and the enlightenment belief in the sovereignty of the individual human subject, which is one reason why this type of movement tends to prosper. On neither side do people really like to accept the, wis the accumulated wisdom with all of its crankiness and the decrepitude of its institution, the accumulated wisdom of tradition. <coughs> so we are not immune to these subversions, even though the, the language that is used is, is religious rather than secular, but the, un the fundamental shift from uh, collective wisdom and inherited wisdom to the sovereignty of the angry and threatened human subject and human identity is something that happens amongst Muslims as it does elsewhere. Now, I mentioned as I started uh, the figure of Louis Massignon, who's been a subject of some uh, interest recently in a lot of conferences and books published about him, perhaps of all Western writers on the religion of Islam, the one who really uh, sought to go deepest uh, and who has had quite, a, quite an influence in uh, Muslim circles and whose uh, disciples, <coughs> some of them did become Muslim, like his most famous disciple, Vincent Monte, who was professor of Arabic at the, uh, at the Sorbonne and was the French translator of Ibn Khaldun and Al-Biruni, a major figure in late 20th century Arabic studies in France, took the name Mansour. He died only about 10 years ago. I used to know him, Allah Rahamo. Massignon star pupil went into uh, the Islamic Ummah, but from a position of real erudition and from a position of looking at what's essential and what is deepest, rather than at the incrustations of the surface and seen from the perspective of the turbulences of the ego. These were profoundly erudite, historically alert people, aware of ambiguity and nuance, and happy to deal with ambiguity and nuance in a way that say, Ofsted is not, and in a way that Ibn Taymiyyah's followers often are not, and a celebration of the fact that part of the gift of traditional religion is to give you uh, the key to an Aladdin's cave, which is full of golden treasures, which seem to be piled up maybe somewhat chaotically, uh, but which is really full of marvels. Now, the fundamentalist in that cave says, well, this doesn't look right. Who made this stuff? We'll melt it all down, and we'll just have the gold. Islam will be just gold, and we won't have all of this stuff and that stuff, and that's all confusing, and that's culture, and let's just have the gold. Uh, well, you end up reshaping it, because you can't have the thing on itself. It has to be interpreted by somebody's culture. It's going to be your culture, um, and your reading of the message of the early Muslims. There's no neutral way of doing it. It's always mediated through yourself or somebody else's self. What they do is to melt down those treasures and to take the gold of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and to create new and often horrifying forms called suicide bombing or whatever it might be to replace those old and beautiful forms. But uh, Vincent Alayrhamo was very aware of the beauty of those forms and was sophisticated enough and had enough experience uh, to know that even though they seem to be kind of dusty and jumbled and in many ways not very well maintained, they are what has come down to us from the past. They are our unique link to the sacred past. And that if you get rid of them and create your own shapes out of those gold, then you will be radically disconnected from that past. One of the tragedies of the radical mind is that in seeking to bracket out 14 centuries of the Umbar story and get back to the pristine early story. In fact, they end up being cut off in a radical way from that early story. And they end up becoming a human form <coughs> that the early Muslims simply wouldn't have recognized at all. And that is, as we've said, closer to the feverish anger of the, the Jahiliya. This is one of the tragedies and one of the subversive aspects of their approach because <coughs> because of the loudness of their claim to have the Islamic state or the Islamic whatever, the world, apart from the scholarly world, and apart from the world of traditional believers, actually believes that. And therefore, the beauty and the goodness of the Salaf themselves are dragged down to the level of these uh, latter-day guerrillas. So 
we have this, uh, this insight that somebody like Monte, who read Evola uh, and was aware of this, this alternative possibility that Massignon himself charted, uh, and aware of the fact that for the educated person, uh, the less educated person is just really looking for ways of feeling good about himself and picking and choosing bits of tradition, whether it be in a fundamentalist or a liberal way. But for the educated person who is aware of the complexity and the brilliance and the depth of the cave, I mean, mashallah, going to any Islamic library and bigger than any of the Hindu libraries or the Christian library just goes on forever hundreds of thousands of great thinkers, only 2% of which has even been printed. That's another thing we need to think about when we consider the, the brilliance of our heritage. You go to the Egyptian National Library, <clears throat> what a shame, what a scandal, even if the book you ask for hasn't been sort of stolen by somebody and sold in some uh, dealer's office in New York, even if the book is still there, uh, the Farash, the guy brings you the book, plonks it down in front of you, then he brings you your tea, and puts it on the pages of the manuscript, and it leaves a little circle. Mali Shebe, never mind. This book, do you have any idea? Yeah, maybe, I've heard it's worth a lot of money, mashallah. That's, that's the estimation. Uh, this is the degeneracy of the custodians of that cave of treasures. And the window's broken, and the pigeons flying in and out, and the, oh my God, and then you go to, the casino at the Ramses Hotel and everything. That's where the energy is in those places now, unfortunately. That's what people care about. But still, those treasures are there. And for the person who doesn't just want to listen to the theme tune of Star Wars as the most important thing in his life, but actually wants to dig deeply and have a richer life, he's going to find those treasures and those wonders in those manuscript libraries. It's important that we conserve them and look after them and digitize them and copy them so that even if they're stolen, um, uh, we still have copies of those treasures. But it's, it's hard work. So we still have that. And we have, and again, uh, Vincent was very clear about this, and this was one of the reasons for his, uh, his Islam. <clears throat> we have the fact of a unifying religious legacy really unifying. Nothing's more unifying than Tawheed in its simple and absolute Islamic form. Monotheism, the most powerful idea in history, Islam has it in a really simple, straightforward, powerful, sacred, uncompromising, beautiful way. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and despite the clunkiness of the Ummah everywhere, the mosques are full everywhere, just because of the power of that idea. But, this, but along with that La ilaha illallah, the other insistence on the, that the only reality is unity. The only ontological fact is the divine. And everything else ends up being just really a point of view. Despite that radical insistence on unity, the Ummah has been this peacock's tail of, of diversity of interpretations and cultures. And so he wrote his book, um, Or Saint Couleur de l'Islam, The Five Colors of Islam, which is his very scholarly exposition of how that has worked in history. So the five colors of Islam for him really meant the Arab bit of Islam, the Persian bit of Islam, which would have included the subcontinent, the Turkish bit of Islam, including Central Asia, the black African bit of Islam, because he was a great scholar of Islam in, in Senegal. He knew Wolof, and he was one of the great experts on that. And the Nusantara, the islands of, the, of Southeast Asia, uh, and Indonesia, Malaysia, that world, five colors. And because he was a, a scholarly master on all of these things, he could show how that beautiful principle of the rainbow reducing to the pure white light of Tawheed was an actuality, despite the diversity of those cultures and the fact they all faced the Qibla from different points of the compass, they all faced the same Qibla. <clears throat> this was, for him, uh, the way forward for Muslims in Europe. But for many of the young Moroccans who used to come to him and sort of talk about these things, he had a very beautiful flat in Paris and constantly, even in his retirement, people were coming. Uh, they were more interested in feeling better about themselves and healing their ethnic traumas and dealing with their, their worries 
uh, than with exploring the beauty of the shining gold in, in the Cave of Wonders, Islam's Cave of Wonders. And they were kind of proud of it, but really they didn't want to get into Fakhruddin Razi's arguments for the existence of God from contingent being. They wanted really to know whether they should go on the next demo about what was happening in Algeria. And that was something that he had to work with constantly with them, identity taking the place of the things that really should be the deep things in religion and the the unhappiness that resulted from that because identity issues, political issues, economic worries, relationship issues, um, they tend to be part of the turbulence of human existence anyway. Um, the fitna is something that is kind of promised to be part of the history of the ummah. Holy Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam says that the, the Adab of the Ummah is fi dunya al fitan wa zalazil wal qatl. The Ummah is subject to Allah's mercy. Laysa alayha adabun fil akhirah. It has no punishment in the next world. Its punishment is in this world. Fitnas and earthquakes and killing. Well, uh, we can see that. And this is just, in a sense, particularly in an age in which religion is in the grip of the mentality of the age, which is about the me, the subject, them and us, the return to Jahiliya. It's kind of part of the package. But what he constantly tried to do is to bring them down to a deeper level to connect with what really is important, faith, hope, beauty, uh, a sense of pride in the incomparable aesthetic, cultural, architectural, spiritual, intellectual, theological, historical, sociological, fiqhi achievements of the ummah, and to connect with that, because that's what is real in religion, and that's what's going on. So one can be Muslim for Islam, and for Allah and his messenger, or one can be Muslim for the Muslims, and the latter is really not a very good option if you want to be on a kind of spiritual, even keel nowadays. If the main thing that you're is Muslimness is connecting with is the latest headlines on the BBC. That's, that's really not a very good place in which to place your principal religious concerns. This is just a kind of storm on the surface of the sea and you need to be deep down with the interesting treasures and the sea creatures because that's really what religion is about. And there's always a different storm and last year's storm will be forgotten, there'll be another one. That's the only predictable thing. So this is what he tried to do and with his book, The Five Colours of Islam, where he showed you know, the depth and the beauty of each of those bands in the Muslim rainbow. Uh, he insisted really that the way to be at those depths as a Muslim is to um, deal lightly with the boundary issues and the anxieties that, that uh, particularly recent migrant communities tend to inhabit on the surface. For the European Muslim, it's not a racial category, but anybody who's really been brought up here and has the European cognitive frame, whether they like it or not, uh, things are easier because you're dealing with the current reality with its culture and with Islam. For the first generation, you're dealing with the current reality and with Islam and with an ancestral set of honor codes and beautiful things and ugly things and those things, and that's a much more difficult stage. So for him, we need to move from the triangular sort of identity to a world where it's just a dialectic between the timeless, beautiful truths and inhabiting that, that golden cave, and on the other hand, seeing how we can still inhabit and maybe even ride the back of the tiger of this strange post-enlightenment, uh, uh, post-religious, uh, modern capitalist, uh, inescapable reality. So if you look at, at his writings, and if you look, for instance, at his treatment of an area that he knew very well, um, he really was a kind of old-fashioned scholar in that he didn't sort of dig one hole very deeply, but he dug a lot of holes actually quite deeply in, in a whole range of places in the Ummah. This is part of the Massignonian tradition in Western Orientalism that you learn all of the languages. Massignon knew Turkish really well, Farsi really well, and Marie Schimmel was another example of them just being a... Arabist or a Persianist, which tends to be the style nowadays, but really to have a broad sense of Islamic civilization, which a lot of Muslims tend not to do. They tend to think, oh, Muslimness is focused on the Middle East, which is really not the case, because most Muslims are not in the Middle East, and the Middle East has not really produced major cultural or intellectual achievements for five or six hundred years. The energy has been on the fringes, and historians 
know, the, the, the fact of uh, the, the, the output of the libraries is, is, is evidence for that. So if you look at, for instance, well, we're probably in France or England at one end, one extreme, one edge of the big Eurasian landmass, which is the really kind of important bit of the world for religious history. And look at the very other edge, which is the fifth of his five colours, which is the Nusantara, the, the uh, 20,000 inhabited islands of, of Southeast Asia. And you look at their engagement with Islam, he finds there a style of Islam that has been really focused on the depths of the religion and on the gold in those treasures, and less concerned with identity and boundary issues starting to change now. But certainly when he was studying it in the 40s and 50s, that, that, that was what that place was about. So look at the, the Wali Songo. We should know about the Wali Songo. Uh, they are the nine awliya, the nine great scholars and saints, who are traditionally credited with the conversion of the island of Java to Islam. Java, really a place whose identity is complicated, really complicated because uh, its deep substrate is shamanistic, and then they became Buddhist, we don't know how, and then they became Hindu, which is strange when you think Buddhist, then Hindu, but we don't know how that happened. And then they became Muslim, and now they're kind of everything. And that unique, extraordinary process, uh, for him, provides an interesting context for investigating the capacity of Islam to, uh, uh, to deal with massive multiplicity and to enculturate itself. Now, enculturation is not the same thing as assimilation, just kind of going native and losing yourself. For him, the great genius of Islam is that it retains its structures of doctrine and of practice absolutely and miraculously intact in the midst of outward cultural forms that can be more diverse than those cultural forms uh, generated by any other civilization. And that's a balance that is characteristic of Islam and makes our cave of treasures so much busier and deeper and richer than anybody else's. The capacity of Islam to uh, foster a plurality while remaining absolutely uncompromising about the deep, important Tawheed religious things. And we often tend to uh, confuse that. Listen to an average mosque conversation in modern Britain, just you sometimes, you know, it's not good to eavesdrop, but sometimes people are speaking with such passion that you can't help but hear what's, what's going on. Nine times out of ten, what they're talking about are boundary issues of various kinds. The sister's hijab is not quite right. And look at what's happening in, in Turkey. And uh, why is the imam's thawb not linen rather than cotton or some other strange thing? Or somebody came to me recently with this really scatty idea saying that you can't recite the Qur'an according to the maqams. Uh, everybody recites it, always recited the Qur'an according to the maqams. No, you can't do that because the maqams are from some non-Muslim culture. So that's another boundary issue. It has nothing to do ever at all in any way conceivably with the usul. It doesn't affect the validity of tajweed if you use maqam nihawend or maqam sabha. Totally irrelevant, but we're so anxious about boundary identity issues that that's dominated our conversation. So we're on the stormy surface. And the depth is kind of not many Muslims diving down there any longer because we're kind of fighting on the surface and we've kind of forgotten that religion is really not primarily about the surface. So in uh, the, the, the Nusantara, particularly in those areas, really Java is the center of everything. There's um, a few other places where there are interesting cultures, southern Sumatra and others, but basically it's Java, really complicated, deep. Uh, outrageous in many ways as forms of syncretism that mm, you can't justify in Sharia. But if you look at the way in which Islam came to those places, it came through the Wali Songo, the nine saints, and their strategy was to say, take people to what is deepest in religion and don't waste their time with the surface things. That will come later and it's not the most important thing. What they believe is actually more important than what they're wearing. Is that really a difficult concept? For some Muslims nowadays, it does seem to be, oh, if she's not wearing a hijab, what if her iman is better than your iman? What, what then? Oh, no. This is, because that's, that's what Islam is. It's just a kind of badge of identity for so many of us. 
But look at, look at the depth. So the Wali Songo, and they're kind of mysterious, uh, almost mythological figures. We don't even know if they were nine. Um, if you actually count up the Wali Songo, you come to somewhere between 40 and 50, um, by my reckoning. But that's just part of the sort of mystique of it, very Javanese. So uh, the enculturation about which Vincent Monte used to write if you go to the second city of Indonesia, which is Surabaya, its kind of its spiritual hub is the mosque and the mazar and the college of uh, Sunan Ampel. He was, uh, again, not quite sure where he was from, probably of Chinese and Uzbek heritage, from Samarkand anyway, so maybe Persian speaking, Radin Rahmet. Uh, and his great pupil, Sunan Bonang, Originally, Raden Maulana uh, Mahdoum Ibrahim seems to have been, have, and again, a Chinese mother, the influence of Chinese Islam and Chinese converts, very significant in that part of the world. Um, Sonan uh, Bonang, significant because he, first of all, you'll notice how they, about the first thing they do is to change their names. He doesn't want to be Maulana, Mahdoum, Ibrahim any longer. He knows that'll get in the way of taking his people down to the depths. When they lived, 90% of people are Hindus or syncretistic you know, animists or whatever. A big task for the Dawah, a long way from the heartlands of the Ummah. Not an easy place to get into, a very deep traditional place, a very static place. And in order to get into the depths, don't mess around to the surface, don't alienate them because you've got some freaky Arab name. Don't wander around in desert clothes in the streets of Surabaya. It might be more comfortable than wearing desert clothes in, in, in Berlin. But still, it's going to kind of be a veil. It's going to get in people's way. And the dawah is going to be of the surface where all the storms are. And you won't get down to those depths. And these people knew that actually the Javanese are people who naturally inhabit the depths. Some sort of dark and freaky depths as well as sort of the luminous depths, there's some very odd, odd, odd sort of superstitions and beliefs there, but they are sort of spiritual, static, indic, deep people um, in their deepest instincts. So going down to the depths, don't freak them out by giving yourself or having some Arabic name. You can keep it, but for purposes of dawah, you are Sunan Bonang, you are Radin, whatever. You use the indigenous Javanese. And don't march around in Yemeni or Moroccan clothes. What could that mean? Wear the Javanese clothes. So these, these um, Wali Songa were famous for magnificently dressing in the magnificent sort of Indic dress of the Javanese. And that overcame the surface barriers and enabled them to take the people of Java by the hand and to dive with them into the depths. So Sonan Bonang's great legacy in many ways was his uh, mastery of the Javanese language and his creation of songs and poems that used the forms of the traditional Indic devotional uh, literature of Java, but with an Islamic content. And to this day, everybody in Java, if they're Muslim, they know and love these songs. They've gone so deep into people's hearts. So in some song competitions, and if you ever go to the, again, it's kind of rather eye-popping sometimes, but if you go to, say, the Indonesian equivalent of The Voice, for instance, very often the songs will be there. There's some ditzy little girl, maybe in a miniskirt, singing away, but it's one of the songs of Sonan Bonang, because it's absolutely axiomatic in their culture, and even the most secular people will still love that, and it keeps, gives them some kind of, of, of a thread that attaches them to to Islam. Uh, in many of the Pesan trends, the, the Quranic schools, these songs are known. Um, the best known of them uh, is this one. This is just an English translation of one of his uh, kind of very simple um, nasheeds. Know that there are five cures to your heart. First, read the Quran with an understanding of its meaning. Secondly, do not forget the Tahajjud prayer. Third, Keep the company of the people whose hearts are luminous. Fourthly, uh, keep your stomach hungry regularly. Fifthly, do not forget to remember God at night. Anyone who can do even one of these, may Allah bless him forever. 
nothing could be simpler. You could kind of get a five-year-old to understand that completely. But everybody in Indonesia knows that, and it's on the song competitions and then the peasant trends, they all learn it. Such an amazing impact. How did he do it? He didn't get them to sing in Arabic, even though they didn't know Arabic, which is what we tend to do here, which is kind of nice and sentimental, but not the way of Dawa. Instead, he goes into the essence of the culture, affirming the beauty of their language and their traditional tonalities, and he brings them up. So thanks to these people, these Wali Songo, uh, the 80 million strong population of Java is actually mostly Muslim now which is pretty impressive. If you compare that to some of the strategies used elsewhere, say in India, where often the ulama kind of maintained quite a distance and didn't use indigenous forms. And wouldn't it be amazing if India now was 80-90% Muslim, mm. but no, the ulama tended to say we are Ashraf and we use Persian and we're kind of a cut above everybody else. And it's only some of them, like Muaynadin Chishti, who said, never mind the surface stuff, never mind writing stuff in Persian, use the local languages, dive deep, and take the people to what really matters in religion, and then the surface will, will follow. But this was the approach of the, the Wali Songo. So um, Sonan Bonang's great disciple was one of the best known of them all, Sonan Kalijaga, again, not a very Arabic name, Sonan Kalijaga, who was the quasi-legendary inventor of the Wayang Kulit, which is the famous Javanese shadow puppets. And this is, again, a great way of reaching the masses. You go to any traditional village in Java to this day, and when they're not you know, watching The Force Awakens, because uh, unfortunately <laughs> that's there as well, they are looking at the shadow puppets, which is really amazing, beautiful, ancient, very simple, traditional art that doesn't require money or technology, just this amazing guy called the Dalang who's sitting behind the screen with the lights shining, so you can only see the shadows, and he works all night. It's an amazing skill telling these stories, and uh, the villagers are kind of really, really into this. And many of the stories that Sunan Kalijaga used were actually not Islamic stories at all, but come from the Ramayana and the Hindu legends. And he used to confer with his, his, his sheikh, um, Sunan Bonang, frequently about what are the boundaries, because he was a man of Sharia. What can we do? So that's why they use the shadow puppets, because it's just forms. It's not really pictures of people, and the fatwas that was permissible. And uh, his sheikh also told him to make the forms really not look like human beings or living beings, but kind of distorted and strange. So if you see the images of the Javanese shadow puppets, they've got kind of long nose and freaky foreheads and they're kind of weird, but beautiful in a certain folkloric way. And so he did this in order to spread the message of Islam through teachings that he found in the indigenous tradition that were still about virtue and about heroism and about dhikr and about the sacred. And within a few generations, the population of rural Java had come to Islam through these methods. Uh, that's an amazing story. And Vincent Monte was very fascinated by this. But the question that then arises is how you, you pull the same stunt in the context of modernity. How to, he rode that Javanese tiger, tiger successfully, and Indonesia is now the world's most populous Muslim country, and in Java alone, there's more Islamic universities than in the whole of the Middle East. It's not insignificant. Uh, and but how do you do that today? Well, the obvious response to that is that it's mm. going to be easier and harder. Easier because you're not dealing with deeply entrenched traditional people who really can't imagine doing anything different to what their great-grandmothers would have approved of. The modern world is not like that. People are much more mobile. People will become Buddhists without thinking. People will convert to religions without thinking in order to marry people. Everybody is mobile and in flux because it's all of the surface. It's all about identity and, hey, this year I'm going to be a biker and I bought my leathers and next year I think I'll do a bit of Kabbalah and then the year after that maybe I'll support Everton, and this is just <laughs> how people work. On the surface, everything's kind of leveled out and becomes just different ways of being. Uh, but for uh, our purposes, taking people down is going to be harder. So on the one hand, people are more mobile. They seem to convert sometimes. I was talking to somebody a few days ago who wanted to marry this Muslim girl. So we're talking about Islam, and I explained it to him and said, do you have any questions? No, it's fine. 
do you know you're going to pray five times a day for the rest of your life? Yeah, that's fine. You, what, you're, you know, you're brought up, uh, you was brought up a Christian. Yeah, that's all right. That's kind of really worrying because uh, he just wanted to marry this girl, and that's kind of that, that's hard to deal with. Uh, so people mobile and convert and unconvert at the drop of a hat. This is predicted prophetically in the Hadith that says, At the end time, somebody will wake up a Muslim and go to bed as a non-Muslim, and then they will wake up as a non-Muslim and go to bed as a Muslim. It's a kind of time of religious sort of Brownian motion, people moving in all conceivable random directions. We have somehow to get used to that. Uh, but on the other hand, difficult, because you're telling people Actually, religion isn't just the surface and headlines and wearing desert clothes and eating biryani and being freaky about your... Uh, it's about going deep. It's about tawheed, about la ilaha illallah. It's about stillness, it's about connection to the sacred. It's about really loving humanity and all of those things. Uh, this is such a new language for people that they need to be taken further back in order to learn the basis of what religion is supposed to be and what human beings have traditionally aspired to. They may not have any sense of what a pilgrimage is really meant to be. A traditional Catholic who converts to Islam can work out the Hajj pretty quickly. An atheist, an atheist background, for him the Hajj really needs to be explained in painful detail before it makes any sense at all. What is this, this tawaf and going round and going this way and that way and throwing stuff, what is that? Because there's no, there's no background, there's no context. That makes things more difficult. And it makes the process of riding this particular tiger, which is a kind of, it's a sort of, not really organic, it's a kind of sort of robotic tiger in a certain sense. It's, it's the machine of modernity, where technique has increasingly occupied what's happening on the surface of the planet, and the human organic bit gets smaller and smaller, and more and more things are done by robots, and even my bank seems to be entirely populated by robots. I can never get through to a human being and buying a ticket, and it's, that's the modern reality. So uh, actually getting through to the, the, the humanity becomes harder because people's experience is not enriched from an early age by complex and rich human engagements with extended families and with neighbors, but largely through engagement with, with these things, uh, handheld devices and other devices, and the teenager who's got the laptop and the mobile phone. And uh, that is something really new, which we have not dealt with before. And taking people from that level into the depths is going to be harder. And riding that particular tiger is going to be really hard. And this is possibly, quite possibly, the stage at which we do have to disengage and say, well, we're not going to be defined by these, this increasingly overwhelming uh, and dictatorial technological culture, um, which has God knows what effects on, on the, the, the fundamental functioning of the human species. So. Here's a fun fact for you. The average American male's testosterone level declines by 1% every year. Mm. And this is one, you know, people are worrying about this and saying, well, is this why relationships are failing and why men are wimping out and women are doing best in careers and 65% and of undergraduates are women and what's going on? Uh, well, one explanation for that apparently is the use of laptops. Mm. Think about that. So uh, we don't know. The extent to which our reality is surrounded by really powerful machines, there's a certain vulnerability about the human metabolism that has its limits and will eventually start to break down. And what it does to the, the spirit and the psyche is, is another thing that doesn't bear thinking about. The stillness, the focused centeredness that is essential for beginning the, the plunge into the center, the depths is the center is going to be difficult if we have never really been in a state of collective integral centeredness because there's always another text and another thing going on and you know, that, that is really, really hard. And the extent to which the species itself and the brain is being rewired um, because teenagers are now increasingly uh, dominated by this form is going to create 
historically unprecedented challenges for religion. Easy to get them to be crazy fundamentalists, yeah, because it's all on the surface and it's all storms and that's what they used to. But to get them into a, t a, a time of stillness where they think it's fine to be doing nothing. Or you can have a long, focused conversation with another human being and experience the divine mystery of the soul in communication with another soul. Or a real uh, relationship of love with another human being. Or a relationship with an animal, which is another thing that human beings have lost. Because part of the richness of the human experience always was with engaging with animal minds. You didn't have to be looking after goats in your backyard, although a lot of people did. But the relationship with a horse when you were traveling somewhere, or with a camel, or that's another aspect of intersubjectivity that's been lost and where we're impoverished by the increasing sort of metallic context of our lives. How you ride that tiger is a big question, and I'm not sure that the, the ulama really have begun to deal with that. And very often you find Muslims saying, we must embrace technology. Mm. Doesn't, when we think about that metaphor, it's kind of, hmm, I can imagine people, things, cats, I wouldn't mind embracing, but technology is kind of cold and angular and doesn't, it's really not going to respond in a very satisfying way. Uh, there's a certain way in which the technology dominates us because it's got a better memory and it, it, it's, it looks better. The phone always looked good, whereas the human metabolism tends to crumple after a while. Uh, it's kind of increasingly, as the human subject maintains its historic mammalian self and the technology gets better and better at the stuff it does, we necessarily shrink. So to embrace this, this enormous monster is something that's a bit worrying. But still, the question is we have to coexist with this tiger. Maybe it's not possible to ride it, but there, it's necessary for us to coexist. Because even the Sunnah Council, يُشِكُ أَنْ يَكُونَ خَيْرَ مَالِ muslim sound hadith in Sahih Muslim, there's lots like it. It's almost the time, the Holy Prophet is telling us, it's almost the time when the best thing a Muslim can own will be a flock of sheep with which he goes to the mountain passes and the places where the rain falls, fleeing with his religion from fitna. Well, first of all, you have to get the, the, somebody to... Uh, dip the sheep and to certify the sheep and maybe they need their ears clipped and then you need to you have to slaughter them in a way that the, the government will approve of and then you, where, where's, where's the valley that somebody hasn't already built a Burger King or an airport or seriously um, the, the real meaning of that is that there has to be a certain inner withdrawal that the surface is going to be so turbulent and crazy that the believer has to be more of a diver than he was in the past. Uh, and that should be a good thing, because that's where the reality of religion is. So that whereas other Muslims are saying, never mind this spirituality business and this art and depth and dhikr, let's stay on the surface, because it's kind of interesting seeing all of the fighting that's going on, and we can actually change the world by being on the surface. Instead of that, mm, let's withdraw. If you can find a sheep and a mountain, perfect, then that's a literal obedience to the, to the hadith. And very often we find that our brothers who say we want to literally follow the Qur'an and the hadith, they tend not to look at that hadith much. They want to be on the surface fighting with some other group that has a different view of the hadith. Um, you won't find too many of them in the Scottish borders with a nice flock of merino sheep, just Allah, Allah. And that's not where they, where they are. They're the front line of the fitna wars. Um, but we need to find ways of recalibrating ourselves so that naturally the things that we think about and the things that we talk about are the things of the depths rather than the things of the surface. Otherwise, we're really going to suffer psychically because, uh, psychically because the surface is so um, almost uninhabitable now. Uh, the surface of the world with its focus on matter and on self and the human subject and me, me, me and money and the whole thing of it is really not, not human, not humane. Uh, so we need to be withdrawing but still with others. And this is where uh, the Naqshbandi speak of the Khalwat Dar Anjuman, solitude in the crowd, which is a tricky one really. 
because our nature is osmotic, to take on the disposition, the values, the lifestyle choices of the people that we hang out with. It's not just young people who feel the peer pressure, but we all do. Um, and often the temptation is, if you really feel different, to feel kind of superior about that or develop certain psychic complexes which are not healthy either. But to be distinct and different, but not to have a superiority complex, what Ebola calls to be an aristocrat, an aristocrat of the soul, uh, that's not a healthy thing either. So to maintain a due humility while in the crowd can only take place when you retain the most fundamental of all religious ethical impulses, which is to be looking out for the needs of others and to find things in other human beings that are lovable. This is what my sheikhs always insisted on. That the sound believer, when looking at others, will always, by his fitra, look at whatever is most lovable in that person. And the sign of the sickness of the soul is to see whatever is the flaw in others. And this is an inflexible rule that should be applied in every situation, uh, whether the person you're engaging with is a Muslim or a non-Muslim or you don't know. Always look to your soul to see if your soul is reaching for and attracted by and impressed by whatever is most beautiful and good in that person. And this is uh, an important skill because it does give us uh, a detachment while still being engaged. If you're taking from others, or you're looking to see what you can take from others, then you are, as it were, dependent upon them, and you are part of that osmotic process of being sucked into the vortex. But if you're a person who is giving, <coughs> that gives you this, if you like, kind of noblesse, this noblesse oblige of the aristocrat of the soul, and means that you are not dependent on them. And that requires a reinforcement, a ressourcement, uh, seeking provisions which can never be done on the surface but the fish and sort of nourishing stuff is down underneath the sea and that's where you need to be. Uh, and this is what one sees consistently. You see that the true scholar is the one who, when a gathering is at an end and people are talking about what people were saying and what they liked and what they didn't like, the true scholar is the one who will always talk about and will encourage the conversation about the good things that happened in the session and the good things that they learnt about people. And the inadequate jahili environment, even if everybody has beards as long as their knee, knees and a miswax going and whatever else the surface might be, if they're saying, well, he has this point in aqidah which is problematic and he looked really weird and whatever, that is the sign of the sickness, which is unfortunately often the dominant mode of the ummah because of our insecurity and our seasickness, as it were, from being on the surface all the time. Uh, the ego predominates and the judgmental nafs amara comes to the surface. So this is one counsel that my teachers always had, which is to look at people with a selective eye to see what is best in them and to have a kind of blind spot to their weaknesses, but not to the extent that you get taken in or fooled by people because the believer is not bitten twice from the same hole, but still sort of not uh, to prefer not to notice other people's faults and to always find a good interpretation for that. And that is not just a moral platitude, but a way of finding this engaged detachment, which is, which is important. Uh, and this uh, is also linked to another principle, which is that there has to be justice in the world. But the sheikhs and Abdul Ghani Nablusi and others make this explicit. Justice is necessary where love fails. In other words, if the sort of natural fitri desire of human beings to get on with each other and to celebrate the mystery of being and to be friends, if that fails, because the ego, it's always the ego gets in the way of that, that's when justice is necessary. Justice is not necessary if everybody is looking out for each other and is in a state of mutual love. That's the highest state. And this is what, where we find um, the Holy Prophet, Ali Salaam, speaking about the tahab the mutual love of the believers as being something that's beautiful to see. But still, there must be justice. So looking out for justice issues in the world is significant. But usually the healthiest way spiritually of engaging with that is to look to local things. Because it's uh, better for the soul to engage with people directly than to press a button on a screen that sends $100 to Burma or wherever, which is a kind of cold engagement really through this huge technological mega structure 
which is in between you and the recipient, and instead to deal with wabda iman ta'ul. So the Holy Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, begin with your dependents, hmm? family, neighbors, and others. That is really where sadaqah begins, charity does begin at home. And that also puts you in a state of not needing, but being needed, which is the necessary prerequisite for being in society without being overly swept away by, by its currents. So be in a strong position uh, and don't be dependent. And the easiest way of ensuring that is to ensure that in your own environment, in your own context, uh, other people, other people's rights over you are being satisfied. So these are some kind of rather random, obvious reflections on the, let's face it, difficult challenge which we have. We tend to say, why is the Ummah such a mess? Well, the fact is the world is in a mess, and the Ummah is trying the very nearly but not quite impossible task of retaining a fully sacred worldview in the context of a planet that's kind of drunk with the excitement of, of, of matter and stuff and the seven deadly sins and whatever is going on. The world is really in a bad state. And the Ummah, of course, <coughs> is colliding with that. And the collision is producing casualties and there are sparks flying and incomprehension on, on, both, on both sides. So it's not too surprising that the Ummah is in its ramshackle state. But the key is that the core is intact. If you're into the depths, Islam is really intact. The Tawheed is there, the doctrines are still there, the theology is still there, the practices are still there. Nobody's ever dared to tamper with the way you pray or the way you fast. You can have a million arguments over who saw the moon last night, but it doesn't really affect the reality of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. The human ego gets as close as it can to interfering with people's sacrality. But Allah always protects those practices and nobody's been able to subvert the basic and beautiful practices of religion, which are what we are hopefully in Islam for anyway. So if we inhabit those depths and we put <coughs> the core of the religion where it belongs, at the core of our lives, and we treat the surface of the things as being something two-dimensional and passing part of the ebb and flow, the flux of, of space and time and separation, distance from Allah, then we will, inshallah, be in a healthier state. And then our intuition will guide us to the nature of our engagement, the extent of our relationality to the enormous and intimidating and quite cold and inhuman mega structures of today's world. There's no simple argument to, should I join the military? Should I become a politician? Should I get into local government? Should I run a hotel? Should I be in, etc.? There's questions everywhere because you're going to deal with a whole range of often, in fiqh terms, unprecedented new questions and complex social situations. There's no simple, single fatwa on any of those issues. But you do need to have this basic disposition of the soul, which is the soul is oriented towards the qibla, which means the depths, the, the ancient, dark mystery, the Abrahamic beauty of God's uh, unchangeability. If that's the center of your life, the qibla is the center of your life, then you will be able to engage with those spaces, inshallah, with some degree of protection, with some sort of hefs from the, the craziness and the sort of polluted gases which humanity unfortunately has generated for itself as a result of our excessive greed and our forgetfulness. So that's the end of the, the homily. Um, I haven't occupied the whole two hours, but my, uh, I think my blood sugar level is running down a bit. Um, I didn't get some of those nice biscuits because I came late as usual.